It is half past ten. I would like to welcome everyone along to this Plan and Applications Committee meeting on Thursday, 12th of January 2017. Could I remember everyone to make sure their mobile phones are switched off and note that this meeting may be recorded and subsequently made available to the public for listening purposes. Okay. Lucy, could you confirm this, Edirant? Good morning, everyone. We have 14 members present. We are quoted. And so far, I have apologies from Councillor Dickel, Councillor Geddes and Councillor Groom. Not present is Councillor Ian Crothers, Councillor Ferguson, Councillor Gilroy and Councillor McGregor. They may be along later in the meeting. Yeah. Sorry, could I submit apologies on behalf of Councillor Ferguson, please? Yeah. Okay, noted. Same for Councillor Gilroy. Any declarations of interest? I'll declare I'll be leaving the meeting for item four because I've taken advice and I'm not into one of the objectors. Jim? Hey, chair item six, I am the applicant. I'll be leaving the building, never mind the room. <laughs> <laughs> No. John. <laughs> Item six, uh, declare an interest in all the applicants, yeah. I think I can go. <laughs> uh, no more. No more. Can we confirm the minutes of the previous meeting? Lucy, could you outline the procedures to be followed? The Planning Applications Committee will consider each application in turn as detailed on the agenda. A case officer or other appointed officer will make a short presentation addressing the determining issues accompanied by digital images. Any late information, amendments or corrections will be reported at this time. Members may ask questions of officers following the presentation on points of clarification. Chairman has been provided with a list of eligible representers who have registered to speak at this meeting within the period specified in Council policy. No other persons will be allowed to speak. The Chairman will individually invite those who are registered in advance to speak to make their presentation, after which they may be questioned by committee members. No questions may be asked of members. The order of eligible parties being heard will be as follows. Third parties objecting to an application, third parties supporting an application, Statutory consultees objecting to an application. Elected members of Dumfries and Galloway Council who are not members of the Planning Applications Committee. Such members should withdraw from the committee chamber after making their presentation. Applicants or their agents. Representers have been placed in alphabetical order and a copy of the public speaking list is available from the committee officer taking notes for proceedings. Presentations will be strictly limited to three minutes per person excepting for national and major developments, which by their very nature are more complex, where the time limit will be five minutes. The chairman of the committee will ask you to come to a conclusion if you take too long. Representers are encouraged to use the time allotted to clarify any points they consider material and address the determining issues. Certain matters are not normally material planning considerations and will not be taken into account by the Council when deciding on a planning application. Representers should not raise any new matters without explaining why they were not raised earlier with the case officer. Please do not repeat what is in the report as members will have already read the report. After all the representations have been heard, the meeting is then in formal session and no members of the public may address the committee from the public gallery. The Planning Applications Committee will then proceed to determine the application or, if appropriate, agree a recommendation to be made to full council who will determine the application. Thank you, Lucy. Item four, let's go on to item four now. Um, Chair. Chair, uh, the minutes of the previous meeting? Did, oh, I must have been asleep, sorry. <laughs> Members, we're going to agenda item number four, erection of residential development and associated works at Maxwellton Station Road, former fuel depot, Tregles Road, Dumfries. 
The application type is planning permission in principle. Reference number is 16 forward slash P forward slash Z forward slash 0261. Northwestern Fries is the ward and the case officer is Chris McTeer. The recommendation is to approve subject to the Successful completion of section, 70, section 75 plan of obligation on six months to the date of the decision of such reasonable extended time scale as agreed by the appointed officer and be conditions associated with the permissions. Councillor McKee. I'm sorry, Chair. I should have declared uh, an interest in that as a, a family uh, relative who backs onto this site, but I don't consider the interest as such that I need to leave the room. Thanks very much, Councillor McKee. That will be duly recorded. OK, Chris, can you take us through your presentation, please? Thank you. Um, as we uh, can see from the, the report, this is an application for a residential development uh, in principle only at the former uh, fuel depot off Terregos Road in Dumfries. The uh, site itself is approximately 1.7 hectares in area and it measures 188 metres long and 93 metres wide at its longest and widest points. The site will take the existing access off to Regals Road and this access also serves several other private dwellings nearby. <coughs> the uh, site is currently vacant as we can see from the pictures and it's not designated for industrial use in the uh, local development plan. The uh, LDP is uh, supportive of brownfield redevelopment subject to other criteria being met. Uh, reports submitted with the application highlight potential flooding and contaminated land as the two main obstacles to development. Uh, additional work done by the applicant in conjunction with SEPA and the Council's flood risk management team have indicated that a suitable drainage strategy can be achieved for the site and the Council's Contaminated Land Officer has recommended a further site investigation with uh, remedial works as required, and this has been added as a condition uh, to the consent. Uh, as you can see, the, uh, the layout is indicative only, as this is an in-principle application. The uh, final design and location of the dwelling house is to be agreed at the detailed application stage. Uh, in addition to these, there are requirements for affordable housing and education contributions, and these will be secured by a Section 75 planning app obligation. And for the reasons set out in the report, it's recommended that this application is approved subject to the successful conclusion of the Section 75 planning obligation within six months or other such reasonable timescale and the conditions listed on pages 13, 14 and 15 of your committee report. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Any members, any questions for the case officer? Jane? Um, yes, I, I have. Um, I would like to know um, about any response from the environmental health concerning noise. <coughs> um, I've read the, the applicant's um, acoustic consultant's report, um, and I would have thought that the um, issues mentioned in there would mean that there should have been some response from environmental health. I couldn't find it. I, I don't know. It might be there. It's just I haven't been able to, to find it. Chris, do you have a response for that? The, um, I think the issues of noise uh, on individual properties would be uh, sort of best looked at at the, the detailed application stage um, as opposed to the, the in-principle application that we've got in front of us just now. Um, it is obviously a material consideration. Noise um, is, is certainly a material consideration for... Uh, you know, it, for an application of this type, but until we have a, a detailed scheme in front of us to know exactly where the um, the residential properties are, it's um, it, it, it's not as much of a not as much of a consideration in this case. Thanks, Chris. Happy with that, Jane? Partially, yes. Um, although um, the applicant's own um, consultant report does talk about problems. Um, suggests and suggests mitigating issues, which I would have thought we might have put into the conditions. There's absolutely nothing um, in the conditions concerning uh, noise, um, and I think it would have been helpful at this stage maybe to have had some mention made of it. We can come back to that later on, maybe, Chairman. We can come back to discussion. that, Jane, I, because it may be simply noise mitigation measures should be included if required or some phraseology like thank, that. Thank you very much, Jane. With that. But we'll come back to that, Jane. Thank you. I'll deal with that at the, the, the end of the, the matter when members are deliberating on it. That's if we agree to progress with an approval. 
Any other questions for the case officer, Ian? Uh, yeah, 2.2, uh, two, Mr McTeer, just uh, the Scottish Water, no response to date. Uh, is it uh, appropriate to have a response at this point? I accept it's, a, uh, it's an in-principle application, but should we not have had something from them? I think that, Ian, we're always having bothered with Scottish Water now, and I think the position we take is if they don't respond, we presume that that's a, a, an agreement. But, Chris, would you like to respond to that? Um, yeah, we, we frequently consult Scottish Water on a, a great many applications, and we do get very few responses back from them, whether that's a, a, an indication of the pressures on their service or not. But certainly when the detailed application comes in as, as part of the wider um, sort of drainage uh, scheme, they would have to demonstrate that they can uh, they can connect to uh, the Scottish water infrastructure. So it's something we would look at at the, the further application. Thanks, Chris. I think Councillor Geddes has been awfully exercised in, 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 in the concern about lack of respect being given to the committee by Scottish Water. I think at one time David was going to take that up with Scottish Water. If he hasn't done so, we could maybe ask David to do that and report back in, in the appropriate time. Ian, do you want to come back? Just, just on that, um, I mean, maybe it would be appropriate if it is a time issue, uh, a time pressure issue for them, um, even if they could give us a response to say that if you don't hear from us, you know everything's all right, at least then we know where we stand. And David will deal with that for us. EA, Stephen. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, it was just a question relating to, uh, it's on page 8, um, and it's, uh, 3.1, as part of the representations <clears throat> and a comment about the consideration made to existing properties with a legal right of access off the depot access. Uh, and I'm just wondering how does that, or how would that, um, given that this is planning permission in principle, how would that be uh, captured in uh, a proper application, or is that something that would, would have to come back at the time? Chris? Um, issues of legal ownership generally um, are, are kind of stand out with the uh, the planning application process as long as the applicant had had highlighted on the form that they owned or controlled all the land involved then we would take that as um, take that as read if if there are um, issues to do with with the access then I, I suppose from a practical point of view we would need some kind of uh, some kind of comfort from from the applicant that that was that that was right enough um, because I mean I know there are um, access to at least two other properties um, from the from the the junction of uh, of Terregles Road. Thanks, Chris. And and again, a lot of that civil a, a matters and and they often raised here, but it's really between the applicant and the individual landowners to resolve that themselves in whichever way they can. Any other questions for the case officer? In that case, thanks for that for the moment, Chris. We now come to objectors. We have one, Charles Douglas. Charles, would you like to come forward, please? Uh, you'll have three minutes when you start your presentation, and I'll remind you with 30 seconds to go just to draw your presentation to a conclusion. Thank you. Uh, I would um, just like to thank the committee for letting me speak today in these proposals. First of all, I'm coming, commenting on the plan that was made, that we were made aware of in July 2016 in terms of the development of 29 dwelling houses. Just to let the committee know that, there are more, that we are more than content for housing on this site, and I think that is the feeling of most of the residents. However, there are some roundabout who aren't. However, we have serious concerns about the proposal that was put to the adjacent properties in terms of Regulation 18.2a. I would like to highlight my main concerns about this application, which are, one, the proposal is out of character with the surrounding dwelling houses, given that any new developments in this area, Maxwell Station Road, are either single storey or storey and a half in height and are of much lower density. Indeed, <coughs> the only two storey houses are our own and our neighbours and the two older houses in Station Road. And these houses date back to the 19th century. This proposal appears to be contrary to the Local Development Plan, OP1, where development proposals should be compatible with the character and amenity of the area and should not conflict nearby land uses. And OP2, which requires the surrounding development to relate well to the surrounding area, as well as respect the important physical, historical and landscape features of the site and requires the developments be well integrated into existing settlements and respect the established historic layout and patterns of development. 
Indeed, this proposal also contravenes OP1 in terms of the houses surrounding the site for the potential loss of privacy, sunlight and daylight to nearby properties. As the committee can see from the drawings in this plan, and this is the, the, the plan for 29 houses, this has a significant impact on our own house where there are four two-storey properties adjoining our boundary with another two which impact our property. Three of these houses appear to be less than eight metres from our periphery. This is also the case for the houses on the station road where they'll be impacted by two-storey houses overlooking the rear of their properties. This is contrary to the design of the new development where there is little or no houses looking into each other, this doesn't seem to be the case for the existing properties. In addition to this, the houses which are on our axis to our and our neighbours' abodes have three driveways joining in. In the total, there will be five driveways in a relatively small space, all of whom are single driveways, so there will be a high possibility of cars being parked on the entry, you have 30 which, seconds to go channels. which may lead to problems in their own homes. Design leads me to believe that this is an area where the children could use for playing. I'll rush on with this. There's a significant development of 29 dwelling houses in a small site with one road access onto Treggles Road, and they'll have an uh, impact in traffic management. I must say to the committee ourselves, in speaking to some of the residents, are quite disappointed that the plans were resubmitted, unamended from the original ones in 2015. Can you just come to a conclusion now, Charles, yeah, please? Okay, then. Okay, I'll just come to my conclusion. I just say. Uh, I'd just like to thank the committee for letting me speak today as we can see that there have been opposition to this proposal and you'll have seen all the objections and they're contained in my objection. But my main concern is that I do believe that these could have been sympathetically resolved by further design layout and cons Thanks, consultation Charles. with the neighbours. Thank, thank you, you very much, Charles. Any members have any questions for Charles? In that case, Charles, we'd like to take your seat again, please. Thank you very much. There are no other because today members are now in session. Archie? Just listen, listen to the objector, there are obviously some concerns about the layout and, and that. Now this is a planning in principle um, application and in the past we've actually had you know, <laughs> planning in principles that have been agreed, but the full application can come back to the, the committee, understanding that the requirement for light and all of that and noise, as, as, as mentioned before. I think this is one of the ones that I would say, yeah, we go, go with that, but the full application comes back to the, the committee at, at the appropriate date, understanding that some of the concerns may be addressed during the actual planning application in full. Is that a proposal by you, Councillor Driver, to approve the application that's set out with the requirement that it comes back to us and including a noise assessment at an appropriate time. That's a request by Councillor Maitland. Is that to be encapsulated in your proposal? Uh, absolutely, Chair, and I think some of the concerns that were raised by the objector may be included in that application as well. Okay. Any other members have a view? Jane? Um, yes, th thank you. That's absolutely fine. Um, I think it should come back to us. Um, but I am curious about the issue of a response concerning noise. Um, would we not normally expect to have a response from um, our own people? Uh, we have roads consultees come back, and I'm quite surprised that we haven't had a response about the noise issue, bearing in mind, as I say, that um, <laughs> the, the, the applicants' people talk about windows having to remain closed, and, and they're talking about alternative practicable mitigation solutions should also be explored, such as locating bedrooms on the opposite side of a building. I mean, you know, this, this, it, it's, it's quite specific, and I would have thought that we should have something very particular mentioned with, in respect to our conditions about noise. If I could just ask maybe our officers to help, help us with that. I'll ask David to, to deal with that, Jane, but remember this is an application principle. We don't have a set a, a planning application that establishes where houses are proposed to be located. But David, can you deal with that, please? Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, that, that is actually the, the nub of it, is that this is an application for planning permission in principle for residential development on the site. The plan that Chris put up before is an indicative layout. It has no status. You'll not see in the description 29 houses. So it could be three houses on the site. It's just establishing the principle of the use of this former depot for residential purposes. 
Now, on that basis, it is actually quite difficult for environmental health to give any specific comment on a scheme that is only for the purpose of it. I would have no hesitation on attaching a condition if it's the committee's wish to basically say that the, the further applications that will have to come in must include a noise assessment because it's obviously been flagged up as an issue and with the benefit of hindsight we probably should have had that in there as a condition. I'm quite happy to put that on. But at this stage it would be now and impossible for environmental health to give any meaningful comment on what effectively is just a red line around the site. Thanks for that, right, David. Jenny, are you content with that? With that additional condition, that's absolutely fine. Okay. Are there any other members? Are there any alternative views? In that case, we're about to agree in principle with the attached conditions. Lucy, can you uh, just confirm what the decision of the committee is with the new additional requirements, please? Okay. Um, the addition is, well, the recommendation is to go, members have agreed to go with the officer's recommendation, and that is to approve, subject to A, the successful completion of Section 75 obligation within six months of the date of the, of the decision, or such other reasonable extended time scale as agreed by the appointed officer, and B, conditions. And members have also asked to include that the application, a full application can come back to the committee, but with a noise assessment, and also, it, the application should address the objector's concerns as part of the application. I, I know that it can come back, Lucy, but it should come back. It's a requirement for it to come back. Is that right? Okay, on that basis, thank you very much, Lucy. That concludes item four. Can someone ask uh, Councillor Martin to come back, please? Right, the item five in the agenda, former Airfield Heath Hall East and Heath Hall Industrial Estate, Dumfries, formation of a storage yard, including erection of a 2.4 metre palisade fencing and gates and siting of the cabin, 15 stroke P stroke 3 stroke 0 174. And we've got Robert Duncan speaking on this one. When are we ready, Robert? Thank you, Chair. I'll just present the photos. I understand we've got a slight technical breakdown, so um, I hope you can all hear me clearly. I don't usually present from the podium. Uh, before I start, there's a few matters within the report I would like to address. Uh, at paragraph 1.3 on page 19, there's a typing mistake where it says greater. The version of greater should have two E's rather than one. Uh, it's the wrong definition of greater there. We're not looking at a kitchen utensil there. Uh, further, at 1.5 on page 20, over the page, members should note that a response has been provided relative to the pre-application inquiry 16F3104, and that was on the 22nd of December last year. Beyond that, at the start of paragraph 4.3, the first sentence um, says that the issue of the nature and height of the storage could be covered by condition. Having thought about that, I think I would be inclined to make that part of my recommended condition one. So if that could be noted by the clerk, I think it should be made part of the recommendation rather than optional, just to clarify that. So turning to the slide, the first slide shows the application site. It extends overall to approximately 3,900 square metres in terms of the adopted local development plan, the land here is an identified business and industry site. It's DFS.BNDI1. Now, there has been guidance provided there at 1.4 of the report. It's a fairly flat piece of land, as you'll see in the photographs. The other thing you'll notice is the proximity of residential development to the north and the northeast, and you will also see the level of representation that you've got in the report as well, which is an important consideration too. I would point out the business and industrial land allocation in the LDP is obviously a lot greater than this individual site. This is just part of that allocation, but we'll come on to that. So moving to the photographs, these were taken in December last year to try and make them up to date. Uh, this is a view, this is looking at the turning area at the end of Tunnel Down Road. You'll see the kind of field, field shelters that are there and the gates and so on and enclosures for the livestock that grazes the site at the moment. So this is looking pretty much due east. Um, 
into part of the application site from the end of that hammerhead with the pool car parked there. This is pretty much in the same location, looking west in the opposite direction. You'll see the locker of Thistle football pitch is on the right-hand side beyond the hedge there, just as a reference point. On the left, you've got a slight spur there acting as a turning area, just where the head is fencing is. And you can see there's activity there, digging the ditch and so on. In the distance, on the horizon, it's slight kind of sunset there at the time of day, but you can see the existing uh, buildings there uh, on Tunnel Downs Road forming part of the industrial estate. This is the view, this is actually having walked, you can just see the tail end of the pool vehicle within the site, just next to the leftmost tree in this picture. This is having walked slightly within the site, so pretty much due south from the turning area, and this is looking pretty much northeast. So it's looking within part of the application site. Again, you can see the kind of field shelf, there's gates and so on, and you can see the residential development beyond that, and you can see the flat nature of this application site. This is having walked further east, and it's looking pretty much due north in this view towards Ash Grove, the established houses there on the left-hand side. To the right, you've got the houses on Harkness Place. Now, going back to the location plan, uh, you can see just the left-hand side at the top of the diagram, uh, the five houses there are on Ash Grove, and the cul-de-sac just to the right-hand side branching off that is Harkness Place, just to make sense of it. This is a slightly wider angle. Again, it's looking north, and as a reference point, number two, Ash Grove, is the building you can see with the white gable, which is slightly obscured by the kind of conifer tree. You can just see the conservatory on it at ground floor level behind the slightly pale screen fence. So those are the properties at Ash Grove going from there on the right-hand side. And then as you move to the right-hand side of this frame, what you're seeing in the distance are the properties at Harkness Place. What I maybe should point out, if you're looking at the distances to the back gardens from Palisade fencing that's proposed as part of this proposal, I, I, I measured that this morning, you're looking at approximately a 30 meter separation distance, if that's helpful. So the next picture is looking back towards Tunnel Down Road and the Derek Mitchell building on the left hand side under construction at the moment. You can see the Harry's fencing there, so that's about the Bellmouth at the moment, uh, which acts as the turning area. Uh, the access to this site, the vehicle access, would be taken from the right hand side, so where the pool vehicle was parked in the earlier pictures. <laughs> Moving to the actual plans that were submitted, this was an amended plan submitted in April last year. So looking at it, I haven't got my laser pointer here, but you can see the turning area there, which is a branch off from Tunnel Down Road. The actual gates to the site would be just as a follow through from that kind of spur. Uh, you can see a dotted line maybe with the trees round about it. The dotted line indicates the extent of the palisade fence and you've got a specification of the nature of type of materials as described in the report at 1.3. And you've also got the temporary building, the porta cabin type building in the northern part of that site. So it's an inverted kind of L shape, the application site, as you can see it there. The land to the right hand side, that rectangular area is a buffer zone, if you like, where the landscaping has been indicated. And that's obviously been covered by condition as well. What I've also included is there's obviously a lot of planning history with this site and associated with this site. So to make sense of the planning history, as it appears in the report at 1.5, I've included this location plan. Now this planning application 14P3204 came in at the same time as an application by NWF, Northwest West Farmers, for a fertilizer um, manufacturing plant. That has since been withdrawn. This application hasn't been determined, but I understand the intention maybe to withdraw that in due course, depending on the outcome of these applications. The applicant may be able to clarify that during your, your questions if you want to ask them that. Um, as I understand it, simply intentions within the wider business and industry site, if you like, have changed on the part of the landowner. We're, we're seeing that with the application you've got in front of you today. 
But as a reference point, this is that previous application, and that obviously generated a lot of public objection as well. The next slide, similarly, this is to look at the other undetermined planning application in the proximity of the site, which is 16P3249. Again, that's referenced to 1.5 of the report. It hasn't been determined. It would have to come before the planning applications committee in due course. I think the key thing for noting here is you'll, you'll see that um, slightly ovoid area on the right-hand side. That's the wider suds area that was identified and was granted permission previously, which would serve and is still intended to serve the wider development and the roads network. There is an overlap between this application site and the existing site as well. So it depends, obviously, what the outcome is with either and both applications. But you could have a situation where they have two planning permissions overlapping in the same piece of land. That's entirely possible. And that really concludes the presentation. So quite happy to answer any questions arising. Members, points of clarification? Stephen. Thank you. Uh, it's actually in relation to the Council Roads Officer's response. Um, and there's a couple of things there, uh, one of which is to do with the works that have been carried out previously. Um, and the Roads Officer has... Uh, effectively said that the previous works would have to be excavated and removed in full, etc. And it's just to get clarity on how much or if all of that forms part of, or should form part of any condition, if that's even possible. And the second part is the transport assessment, um, of which we don't have any indication what the level and volume or type um, of vehicles or traffic is going to be. Um, and the Rose Officer has said it would be appropriate the applicant clarify this. So, uh, But we don't have any sight of that in terms of being able to determine this. So I'm just wondering, is that something we should uh, attach as a condition, that that be done? In relation to the first issue, I mean, I'm looking at the points made at 2.1e, the, the, the bullet points here on page 21 that have been raised by the Council Roads Officer. The, the first points are in relation to the LDP allocated site, DFS BNI 1, and the planning history. There's obviously been planning permissions granted for the roads layout and the SUDS drainage scheme for that. Um, what, what the concern is with the wider site is there is a requirement for an adoptable link from Tunnel Down Road going through towards Catherine Field Road, and that was shown in previous applications. This is a kind of incremental part of a wider development of the site, but the applicant is aware of that requirement as they're developing out this site, so, so they are aware of that. The other thing in relation to SUDS is we've looked at that, and the SUDS basin that you saw in the last location plan there, it, it is compatible with this application site in the sense you can do both. You can provide the fence compound area and the SUDS basin as well, so there's not incompatibility there. As far as the level and type of vehicles and traffic generation, I did ask the question of the applicant's agent quite quite late in the process, and I didn't get a response. So you, you could uh, attach a planning condition to that if you liked. My own view was, given the nature and type of materials that were going to be stored within the site, the size of the site and so on, uh, I didn't really think it was going to create a, a significant issue you know, in terms of causing disturbance. But that was just a view I took myself. It wasn't informed by any information that was submitted. I mean, there is, I understand, the applicants here today to answer questions as well, so maybe that's something that you could comment on uh, as well. But um, I didn't actually get any information relative to that point, no. Thank you, Robert. Anyone else? No. Nope. Got the objectors now. Could we have uh, Jane Lindy, please, reading a prepared statement on behalf of David Crawford? And you've got <coughs> three minutes, Jane, and I'll let you know 30 seconds to go. So you yeah. can sum, sum it up. Okay, this is very short and sweet. I feel that this application would have a negative impact on my family and my family's quality of life and ability to enjoy, to fully enjoy our family property. The ne this negative impact would be due to two issues. Firstly, the location of the development would impact on our enjoyment of our mature garden. Secondly, the proposed location would also negate a proposed buffer zone which was outlined in a previous application under reference 14 oblique P 
a bleak three, a bleak oh two oh four. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Jane. So we've got Jane speaking on behalf. You've got thirty seconds. You've got three minutes as well. <laughs> three minutes as well, Jane, and I'll let you know thirty seconds to go so you can sum up. Okay, thank you. Thank you. My objections are the lack of information regarding the storage yard given by Mo Plant Limited. Keith Hall is a quiet residential area that has 3,000 plus residents, and this yard is in very close proximity to surrounding properties and gardens. Residents have a right to more information. Mo Plant have stated that the land will be used as a secure storage yard for contractors' equipment and building materials. Due to the proximity of properties, it is important for us to be informed of one, what exactly will be stored at the yard, two, what will the material be open, will the material be open to the elements, will there be odour, dust, etc. Three, how often will the yard be visited to deposit building material? Four, what will the operating hours of the yard be? Five, how frequent will traffic movements be in and out of the storage yard? Six, how noisy will delivery and removal of equipment and building materials be? Uh, another point I wanted to make, um, Mr Duncan showed photographs there of the site, but already Moplant has started works on the site access road. I have photographs here that were taken the other day to show just the extent of the work that has been started. Surely this should never have been started before planning permission was granted. Was this not extremely presumptuous on Moplant's behalf? As you be aware now, there are two outstanding planning applications lodged by the Armstrong Group Company, which Moplant is a part of, planning application 14P30204, Proposed Material Recovery Facility and Planning Application 16P30249, which is a planning application for an industrial building of six units. As a local resident and a representative of the community, the community who have always strongly opposed the proposed material recovery facility, is this the Armstrong Group's way of trying to manipulate the planning application process? I thank you for listening to my objections. I thank you. Members? Ian? Uh, yeah, a question on that the comment you made in the photograph, uh, Mr Lundy. Did you make planning department aware of the fact that you felt that there was development of the roads? Um, uh, no, because um, these photographs were only taken on Tuesday the 10th of January at 11.25. Would it be appropriate, Chair, if uh, perhaps planning could, could comment on, on uh, the, the impact of, of this uh, development? Well, the simple fact of the matter, I wasn't aware of that because obviously the pictures I took were taken in December and I haven't visited the site since. Um, if anyone undertakes works that require planning permission and they don't have planning permission for that, then they're undertaking those works at their own risk. I mean, obviously they haven't got a decision on this planning application. Well, surely that's very presumptuous. Uh, well, it's, it's brothers to say, but I mean, the simple fact of the matter is if they undertake the works, it's undertaken at their own risk. Any other members? Ian. Thank you. You made reference to, I think it was a planning application in 04, it was reference to a buffer zone. Could you expand on that? Um, I'm led to believe the buffer zone was supposed to be 15 metres and in parts it's going down to 2 metres. And that was in Mr Crawford's letter. Any other members? You may take your seat, Jane. Thank you. Good afternoon. Ian Murgatroyd, please, reading a prepared statement on behalf of Alan Parry. And you've got three minutes as well, Ian, and I'll let you know 30 seconds to go. OK. Um, speaking for Alan Parry, this application seeks to unfairly manipulate the planning process at the expense of the community. It appears a simple application, but its brevity and lack of detail cause concern because it materially affects an existing submission for the same site, namely 14 stroke P stroke 3 stroke 0204 proposed material recovery facility. 0204 continues to face strong and sustained community opposition. Its presentation before committee has been delayed for two years already. This application covers for 0204 potentially shaping a later hearing more favourably, seeking success through stealth. But it is manipulative to have multiple applications overlaid on the same site. For example, this application is entirely within the boundary of 0204 and would reduce the proposed 15 metre buffer zone to less than 2 metres. It would remove the need for neighbourhood notification for other submissions. This is clearly contrary to best practice. 
There is no adequate traffic assessment of us or assessment of cumulative operations as a chartered environmental health officer and safety practitioner. I offer that noise assessments fail BS4142 standards, presenting flawed and misleading analysis, even referencing a road that doesn't exist, to artificially hike background noise levels and cheekily presupposing this committee's decisions. The applicant omits the type of material to be stored and offers no hours of operation. Given the applicant's business and associated waste management interests, there is huge potential for significant statutory and private nuisance. Noise, dust, odour, light and effluent would all adversely impact on the environment, <coughs> residents' amenity and quality of life. This is worse where the application would hardcore over land identified for a suds pond. There is no detailed plan for sustainable drainage or management of surface water with potential flooding and contamination issues. Heath Hall wants sustainable economic growth, but not development at any price. The Council have done great work overseeing Heath Hall's growth into a residential community of some 3,000 voters. This residential development is rightly in line with the aims of Scottish planning reform and importantly with our Council's local development plan. You have delivered the right type of homes in the right places. You have actively Fair approved homes go, right up to the boundary of the airfield. Please now continue to listen to this community that you have helped shape and have empowered. We welcome positive development, but we also deserve your protection to safeguard our environment for future and preserve our quality of life. I chose to raise my young family in Dumfries and Galloway, the natural choice, one of many families that joined the progress of Heathall. I urge you to think about the impact on all of these families, not confronting but collaborating with the community. We invite you to agree with the Thank residents you. Can you wind up? and reject this inappropriate cumulative development. Thank Aye. you. Thank you. You may take your seat. Thank you. Could I have uh, Susan Parry, please? You've got three minutes, Susan, and I'll let you know 30 seconds to go. Okay, thank you. Okay, I've um, objected to this application due to the lack of information that we were given when it was submitted, which meant that um, I couldn't make an informed decision on how it was going to affect uh, my enjoyment of my own home and the surrounding area. It fails to specify the type of building material that's going to be stored on the site. Is it new material or is it old material that will eventually be moved on for recycling at the Lockside facility? Because each type of material presents different challenges to the local community. It fails to give any operating hours and the types of vehicles that we're moving in and around the site. And given the type of work that is undertaken by Mole Plant and its sister company Armstrong Waste, that's a big concern. These omissions have meant that I, and indeed the wider community, have been unable to determine the impact of any noise, dust, smell, vermin, or in fact light pollution that may be a result of this application. You've already heard that it uh, completely lies within the boundaries of application 14P30204. And although these should, by due process, be considered separately, I think it would be remiss of this committee to approve this application without detailed referral to the previous application. Um, this application also, within the boundaries of this application, is 16P30249 for the industrial buildings, which means that there are now three active applications for the same piece of land. Um, as an individual, I'm concerned about the implications about granting this application and the effect that they may have on the two associated applications and whether this one is in fact a precursor to just lighten the inferred impact of the larger development and therefore manipulating the process in its favour. Personally, I would welcome a uh, development, but not at any cost and not at any cost to the 3,000 residents in Heath Hall and I ask you to preserve our quality of life in our community. And I'd like to thank you for your time today, and I hope that you will reach the right decision. Thank you, Susan. Members? Susan, you may thank take you. your seat. Is that all the objectors? Could I have Andrew Clark and Alan Newbiggin, please? Applicant, agent and applicants, please. And you've got three minutes, and I'll let you know 30 seconds to go. Whenever you're ready. 
Thank you, Chair. Andrew Clark of Robert Potter and Partners as agent, along with Alan Ubigging as uh, the applicant on behalf of Mall Plant. Uh, I would just like to start off by saying this is a, a straightforward application for a general contractor storage yard on the site. It's an allocated land. And uh, for clarity as well, I would like to point out that there has been no works associated with this application that have started on site. There has been site operations, which is commencing uh, the uh, application, which was 13 oblique, P oblique, 3 oblique, 0463, which is for the roads development, which was previously approved, and uh, the planning uh, department have been advised of those operations starting. Uh, I would just like to commend the case officer's report, and uh, we'd ask that you um, are now minded to approve the application, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Members, Ivor. Are you able to tell us what materials you plan to store on the site? And would any of those materials have uh, any sort of uh, effect on whether it be ground conditions, etc., if they seeped into the ground, etc.? For further background, um, Mall Plant have facilities already, their office and yard in uh, Heath Hall. Uh, they had a reduction in their yard area by further developments that were carried out there based on um, a development by a JCB building. And uh, as part of that, their area of yard was reduced. And the principle uh, for this application is to try and give back uh, ground to Mall Plant to use as a yard area. Uh, and the basis of the materials would be general contracting materials for the nature of their business, which would be road curbs, drainage pipes, concrete, ring manholes, uh, materials such as that. Thank you. Archie? Uh, two, two points here. First of all, uh, one of the messages from the objector is you haven't sort of specified the operating hours and there's also some form of suggestion that this is a way of getting a previous application through. Can you give a response to that? This is a, a standalone application with no connection with uh, the uh, previous application. The, the, um, as further background, the, the, the two applications that have been mentioned, which was a Material Reclamation Yard and NWF, were looking at a master plan for the entire former airfield site. Uh, and there was a lot of objections to those, and NWF ultimately pulled out to that. Um, since then, Mall Plant have reviewed how to take this site forward with what the developments should be, and uh, the, over the period of time, they have been looking at uh, a, a, a series of possible business and industry developments on the site, which. Uh, they're still trying to put together as uh, an approach forward, and we've been in discussions with the planning department over those proposals. And uh, we are um, the, the, the further application, which is still to be determined, is a catalyst to that of small business and industrial uh, developments, which are would uh, over time intend to come forward as as a, a as new developments on the site, which will be much more palatable, uh, light industry and business development. Um, the, the, the previous uh, material reclamation yard, there is no current uh, intentions to have any form of development like that. And as, as the case officer has said, that the intention is that that application will be withdrawn. Operating hours, operating, operating hours and traffic movements, please. Operating hours, more plant are obviously a, a, a general contracting business, so they operate over um, the hours which are uh, a general um, business operating hours, Monday to Friday and Saturday mornings. It's, um, a, it's, it's not a manned yard. It's not, a, it's, it's not open to the public. It's not... Um, uh, it, it's it's not constantly serviced. It's purely a, a, a yard for uh, periodic use and picking up and dropping off of materials. It's it's not uh, it's not something that will be open and operating um, constantly. 
Okay, Ian. Thank you. I had two points. One of them was the same as Councillor Driver. Although I'd still like a wee bit more information about your operating hours. You said standard business hours. What are standard business hours? Uh, and secondly, could you make some reference to the, there were a comment made by one of the objectors about the reduction of the buffer zone from 15 metres to 2 metres? In fact, two objectors mentioned it. Can you make some comment on that? The buffer zone was a proposal which was based on the two previous applications for a material reclamation yard and NWF uh, um, feed mill. Uh, they were clearly entirely separate forms of, of development, um, much more onerous in terms of their impact. Uh, those applications had a, a, a buffer zone. Um, the, the nature of this application basically is a, as a, a a yard, a storage yard with um, limited height, uh, has has uh, a, an area for landscaping as opposed to a buffer zone, which was in, intended as a a mound. Um, operational business hours, Alan. Do you? Yeah, thanks. Uh, our operational hours are generally from eight till half four, and probably to about twelve o'clock on a Saturday. We don't work. Uh, generally don't work on a Sunday and uh, we don't really work much past past half past four, five o'clock the end of the day. Thank you. Uh, Tom. Stephen. Yeah, thank you. I mean it's been touched on already. Uh, I think um obviously it'd be uh, good to have that clarity just on what the buffer zone is going to be, but you've you've um, uh, addressed that in your previous answer to the <coughs> the other councillors. Uh, the other one is just the transport uh, plan. I think it would probably be helpful um, just to actually be able to specify just for the benefit of the residents nearby so they know what to expect in terms of the level of traffic movements. I know you've said it's sort of light usage. It would be operating between 8 and half 4 and on a Saturday morning, but I think still that doesn't really say just how, much, how many vehicles are going to be moving back and forward and with what. It may be an unmanned site, but I'm sure it's going to be there because it's needed um, and therefore I'd imagine there'd be some amount of traffic which which could be at least uh, for the benefit of community engagement um, you know an indication could be given so that people knew what to expect is that something that you would be able to to do it's certainly something we could do we see it as a an overflow storage from a current facility a current facility he fall is um, very stacked out uh, we're, we're looking at this to be an area where we can put materials where we don't really go to very often. Um, so actually when we'll actually go to lift the material and drop it off will be quite random and quite sporadic. Um, we don't have an awful lot of vehicles. It's either a small transit van or uh, three lorries that we currently have. Uh, that's all we would be running. But the actual times when we would drop it off um, and how many, it would be very difficult to tell. But it would be more for an overflow storage rather than something we're doing every day. Thanks, Chair. Mr. Clark, you mentioned the storage of building materials and you specified pipe, uh, pipes and curbs, that type of thing. Is there any intention to store, for however short a time, builders' rubble? I don't think so. Um, we don't really keep builders' rubble anywhere. Uh, we have a small um, bay that we use in Heath Hall, which we continue to do, which is three metres by four metres, and it just gets filled up and then emptied and filled up and emptied. We wouldn't intend to use that. Uh, again, we don't have the plant at the yard that we would then take the stuff and material. We'd actually have to take plant to the yard to load it to take it away, which would be counterproductive. So any any excess material, loose material that would come in would stay at Heath Hall where we currently are and then get deposited from there. It wouldn't go to the the one uh, the current application. Ian, Nick. Uh, thanks, Chair. Just the, 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 the current road works that are, are taking place at the moment, uh, the, one of the objectives had, um, uh, had uh, identified. You have nothing to do with that, or are you aware that they are, they are happening at the moment? Yes, that's to do with more plant, and it's it's uh, the uh, it's the intention to create a, a a road to service the site, which was previously approved, 
and um, following that will be uh, hopefully a number of applications for the development of the wider site, the overall development of the site. Um, and the, the nature of that will be um, new businesses and new light industrial units which will come forward. And that's been Morpant's process since the, the fall of the NWF application to um, try and develop a strategy of how, the, how new developments can happen on this site. Um, so that's the, the commencement of it to try and, uh, by starting the formation of the road, um, to start trying to move this forward and implement it. So, so you're satisfied that uh, that planning permission has been given for those works? So that's, that's what I want to be clear about. That's correct. It was application 13P30463 and uh, a notice of implementation of the works has been issued. Yeah. Alistair. Thanks, Chair. Uh, gentlemen, you say this is an unmanned, going to be an unmanned site, not open to the public. So my question is, uh, what uh, steps are you taking uh, in terms of security? The, the perimeter fencing is the, ultimately the security, and also there's a cabin there, which is um, it's it's not. Uh, um, serviced by uh, workmen that's on the site constantly, but it'll be there for security measures. Right. No other questions. Thank you very much, Mayor. Turn to your seats. Members are now, now in session. Tom? Yeah, I've got a couple, couple of points. Um, but what one of the points has been raised, uh, I've got a mind to, to grant it, but one of the points raised by the objectors was the uh, opening hours. And I take it we can put a restriction on the opening hours there. Uh, I think the applicant did say they don't operate on a Sunday, so that's one day of the week out the road that uh, no Sunday opening. Is there hours restrictions we can put on Monday to Friday and on a Saturday that would be reasonable hours for a, a business of that type? Be bearing in mind that the application itself is just talking about a, a storage yard, but the applicant is a construction company can we put a restriction on the type of goods to be stored there, i.e., since it is a construction company that's making an application, and the applicant himself has stated it's in addition to uh, the present type of uh, premises that, that he has, can, he, can we then put a restriction on saying that uh, a storage yard for construction uh, materials only? So if you can maybe answer those two, uh, two questions. Robert. Um, Chair, in relation to the first question about condition about operating hours, if the committee think it's reasonable and necessary to put a condition on and can say what the purpose of the condition is, you know, why impose that condition, then you, you, you can impose a condition which limits the operating hours of, of the site. For example, if you feel that's necessary in the interest of residential amenity, then you can do that. Um, it's at the discretion of the committee. With regard to the nature and height of materials within the site, again, at the start of the presentation, I was alluding to the first sentence at 4.3, where I've said the proposed nature and height of stored materials within the site could be controlled by condition. Uh, I think that statement still stands. What, what I was driving at was, benefit of hindsight, I should have probably made that part of my recommendation and made that part of uh, condition one which I haven't done. So what I was thinking was maybe add something to condition one that said that for the avoidance of doubt, the nature and height of materials stored within the application site shall be as stated in the application and then state what they actually are, you know, into a height of three metres. That, that, that was my only suggestion with that. So yeah, you, you obviously, again, it's at the discretion of the committee, but you can control the nature and height of stored materials by condition as well. Jane. Okay. I mean, I, I'd be quite happy to move and put these uh, two conditions in. One, on the nature of the materials to be stored, and two, uh, operating hours of the site. And the reason for that being is it is in a uh, close proximity to a residential area, and I think it wouldn't be unreasonable to impose uh, reasonable hours of operation Monday to Friday and Saturday uh, morning, early afternoon. David. 
So, Chair, can I just clarify what Robert was answering was uh, in respect of condition one, which was the maximum height that materials could be stored, but Councillor McCotter is referring to the type of materials which are being restored, which is slightly different. Is that what you're putting forward? Well, for, for, for Robert says in your report is the nature of materials, and what I'm saying is that if you're talking about the nature of materials, since the nature of the business of the company is construction, that it should be specified that since it's a construction company, the yard can only be used for storage of construction materials. That's the nature of the, the business, I would have thought, is it not? Sorry, just, just to be absolutely clear, um, it's going back to 1.3 where it says it is intended that the area be used as a secure storage area for contractors, equipment and building materials. When I'm suggesting the condition for the nature of materials, that's what I'm driving at, the contractors, equipment and building materials. So in other words, the, as Mall Plan have said, it's the overspill from their existing depot. That's what they store there at the moment. They're looking for an overspill to that. So when I'm saying nature of materials, it's really that that I'm trying to define. Jane? Uh, I, I think it's perfectly sensible to put in a condition saying that we're expecting the uh, applicant to comply with the application. So yes, I have absolutely no difficulty with that as a proposal. Um, but, um, Chairman, I, I am doubtful about um, constraining a business with respect to uh, operating hours. I, I just don't think that's a sensible thing to do on an established industrial site, which has been established for years and years and years. Um, members will remember, I think, that um, one of the council priorities is to support our small and medium-sized businesses to be established and to grow. Um, and I would suggest that if there is no really necessary or precise reason for putting um, a restriction on operating hours, given what we've heard with respect to the application, I would suggest to members that we do not do that. I don't think it's necessary. Um, I would also say to members that this area is a part of Dumfries um, from which people are actually moving in terms of businesses. So I don't think you should do anything to make life more difficult for businesses in Dumfries and Galloway. It's not what your policies actually indicate. So I would suggest that um, with the, uh, the restriction or the, the, the clarification on what we actually are going to store in this area um, in accordance with the planning officer's suggestion, um, and I think that would probably chime in with what Councillor Makoto is wanting, I would suggest we agree the application. Yeah. Ivor. Chair, it's <clears throat> down the lines of the security sort of aspect, you had the port carbon type security cabin. I take it that there'll be lighting on the site to, uh, to make sure nobody's intruding, etc. Could we make sure that there's no light pollution affecting any houses so that the lights are actually on the site rather than having maybe spotlights blaring into people's back gardens, etc. I don't know if that's part of the thing or it could be asked that that happen. It would be open to committee to make that part of the condition, yeah, we could ask for details of what lighting within the site to be agreed uh, in advance. Uh, I wouldn't expect there to be an issue because the cabin's on the northern side of the site and I would expect the lights to shine from there into the site. But again, you could put a condition on that would require that to be agreed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, um, I think it was really just to do with the operating hours. Um, I'd be, given that this is a, a site which is part of a wider master plan, I suppose, um, I would be wary about s putting an operating hours condition for one particular site when other businesses may not uh, necessarily need the same sort of operating hours restrictions, and then it would seem a bit unreasonable that one you know, you'd have different uh, situations for different businesses or light industries across the site. So we'd either have to be very careful that we set the same operating hours for everybody um, and kind of remember which ones we'd done before, etc., which we're not always that good at. So uh, I would be more inclined to go with what Councillor Maitland's saying, and, which is accept that the, the materials, the nature of materials and storage is, is determined as part of the condition, but... Um, but not specify or restrict the operating hours um, 
because it may, I don't think it would actually be reasonable given that we don't know what's coming ahead. Ian. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I'm afraid I, I disagree with Councillors Thompson and Maitland. I think it's imperative that we do control the operating hours here uh, and that we're dealing with this application that's on just now, not a, a whole master plan. We're dealing with a specific application. So I'm quite prepared to, to second Councillor McCaughrey's uh, motion to make a restriction on the, the operating hours. Jane. Could, um, could Councillor Hislop possibly just tell me exactly what the wording was on the the lighting, because I'd be quite happy to add that in. I think uh, it was that any lighting that takes into consideration the fact that it's not causing a light nuisance into domestic properties. David. Uh, Chair, if it helps, there is a standard condi condition we have for artificial lighting, which um, requires details to be submitted and approved. And then if there's any nuisance, then the, the lights have to be angled to satisfaction of the council. So we would just use that one. Jim? Uh, just in support of what Councillor Maitland is saying, look at the weather we've had today. Can you imagine a lorry turning, turning up at 10 minutes after the time we've set and nobody allowed to unload for 24 hours or 48 hours? It's absolute lunacy. And we've also got to be making conditions that are enforceable, and that isn't really enforceable, or at least it would be a great cost, I suppose, to the Council. Maybe not that's a, a, a factor to be considered, but in terms of business, I don't think it's right, and I would certainly not be supporting that element of a, a proposal. So you can use uh, the weather conditions, and that's the most thing to say. The lighting didn't get back to 11 o'clock last night due to the fourth road bridge. We got any other members? Archie. Could Could you clarity, there is <coughs> there is on this application the 30 metre buffer between the application outskirts and, and, and the, 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 the residence. It's probably best shown on this plan. This is the submitted layout plan, and it's unfortunate I don't have the laser pointer. Ah, that's a fair point. Could you use the mouse? Um, the, the, the actual location of the Palisade fence is around this area here. So it's the inverted L shape. That's the area that would be used is the area there. So you've got that rectangular area, which is outlined in red when you look at this area. It's part of the area outlined in red. But when you look at that distance there, that's in the order of 30 metres. When you look at the red area, obviously the two metres, there's very little distance between the rear boundaries of those gardens and that red line, as has been pointed out. It's when you take into account that rectangular area, because the palisade fence is going there. And that's where the extra distance is coming from. That's been shown to be landscaped, and there is a landscaping condition on it. So that's where, when I'm mentioning 30 metres, it's 30 metres relative to the fence compound. Uh, Stephen, did you second Jane? Well, I was, uh, given the addition of the lighting uh, condition, um, then I'd be happy to second Jane in terms of um, accepting it, but without the operating hour restriction. I think another member will go to the vote. Okay, can I just be clear? Um, Councillor McCoughtry put forward a motion seconded by Councillor Blake to um, approve subject to conditions. However, with the restriction of um, to business hours, that it would be Monday. Do you want to just <laughs> clarify that for me, Councillor McCoughtry? I, th I think if we specify that it's uh, <clears throat> well, within certain hours, but if the motion ones you can dictate the hours then, it's not unusual to put restrictions in hours then. We've done it with other businesses, shops, quarries, etc. But the th I think the thing is that it's not just subject to conditions, but subject to that additional condition about the lighting that we accepted and the other additional condition about the nature of the business as well, which Robert uh, took on board, which he was, go he was going to call condition number one. So sub subject to those two additional conditions. 4.3 so get, gets added on the, uh, the condition, the recommended decision number, uh, number one. Is that correct, Robert? I'll just be clear that condition one that's related to the height that and the... Added. Okay. If it helps, as I, I've noted down basically what what you would be doing, there's there's only one difference between the motion and the amendment as I've got it. So the, the motion would include the amendments that Robert set out to condition one 
and attaching uh, an extra condition about lighting. There was also a transfer to the amendment, but um, the addition for the motion is that you've got an hours of operation condition that the amendment doesn't. Is that correct? Okay, so just to keep things simple, the amendment is that there would be no restriction to the uh, operating hours. Um, so can we proceed to the vote? Councillor Martin? Amendment. Councillor Dempster? Amendment. Councillor Blake? A motion. Councillor Dick? Amendment. Councillor Drybra? Motion. Councillor Hislop? Motion. Councillor Maitland? Amendment. Councillor McCoughtry? Motion. Councillor McComb? Amendment. Councillor McKee? Motion. Councillor Ogilvy? Amendment. Councillor Syme? Councillor Thompson? Amendment. Councillor Witts? Amendment. And I can confirm that the amendment carries with eight votes to six. And therefore, officers have agreed to approve subject to conditions, but with the restrictions in relation to lighting and condition include option one, but there would be no restrictions to the business operating hours. Got it. Number six, number six is 6060 60, 60 High Street, Sanka, plan an application for installation of a flue to the rear of a dwelling house, 16 stroke 1671 stroke FUL. And we've got, no, Beth's not, Robert's doing this one because Beth's got flu. No, you doing this, please. You're doing this, David. Okay, thank you, yes. Uh, apologies from Beth, she's, I'm afraid, off with flu at the moment. Uh, so, basically the, Location of the property is right on Sankar High Street. As the next slide will show, it's a two-storey property with extension to the rear. And what you're actually looking at uh, is, if we can use the pointer on it, then just at the left-hand side there, you'll see there's a flue, which because of the, the height of the flue and its relation to the roof, it does actually require planning permission. But it's a, a fairly straightforward flue that you see added to a uh, Wood burning stove, which would be added to the, the inside. And at the front of the property, you would not be able to see the, the flue from any point on the high street because it's all tucked away to the rear. And this shows the, the rear of the property. One of the downpipes would be removed there to actually put in the flue, which would run down that side. You can see the, the windows to the left hand side there are on the upper floor of the, the NISA store. Uh, where these are not residential windows as far as we can tell. And the next one, that just shows that a little bit clearer. So that's a shop that's next door as opposed to residential property. And that's the, the open boundary with the, the neighbouring property in the rear garden. <laughs> I knew somebody was going to spot that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next one, please. I think that's it, really. So it requires permission because of the height of the flu, and it requires to come to committee because of the applicant is, but otherwise it's a straightforward application which we are recommending approval unconditionally. Archie. Hey. Actually, I'm, 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 not, I'm not going to ask for a site visit because you, you, you need to get a cup of tea off him anyway when you're going up. So, um, just, just to go with the recommendations here. Yeah. Uh, Chair, it's just there was a flu installed just up the road from where I am, and one of the things that's happened is there's a cowling on the top that spins round, which causes a kind of nuisance to the neighbours as the sun hits it and lights flash off it. Is there anything we can do about that? Not that I want to move against it, but just make sure that it's not going to cause a nuisance to neighbours with a kind of... It's like a strobe light effect. I don't think there... 
We, we can look oh, back no. at it, but I'm fairly certain there isn't actually uh, one of those rotating cowls on that one. It's just a fixed one from what I can see. Members agreed? I mean, I have no other further business. Thank you very much. Ronnie. I was reading that the Scottish Government's coming back up for consultation on, on uh, planning rules and, uh, and taking away some of the burdens, as they call it. I just wondered if we're going to get a seminar because there's a consultation up uh, for us to feed into that before prior to the local elections, if you like. I just wonder if there's any plans for uh, share that with us. Uh, yes, there is that consultation which just came out earlier this week and my understanding is that Steve and probably myself will be getting together to do a report to the EI committee, which is the, the overall one on that. But yes, because the closing date is the 4th of April, we will definitely need to put it to the March EEI committee and we definitely would want to make comments on it.